So again, for me, it's an honor to be here. I, I yesterday I was in a rush and I was nervous, so I didn't uh, thank Maria for giving me this opportunity and a pleasure to be with all of you yesterday at today's session. So, okay. I, I'm hearing an echo. I don't know if you, you're hearing it also, but okay. So today's session is going to be about gender relations in the labor market. So this session will answer the following questions. Uh, do men and women differ in most labor market outcomes? And why is the gender gap in this area persistent? We will frame the question, these questions in a labor market context of a slow productivity growth, intensification of global competition, the decline in workers bargaining power, and uncertainty in economic conditions described by Veneria, Gunselli, and Floro 2016. Despite important gains, substantial difference between men and women remain concerning labor market outcomes. Women workers tend to prevail in low paying sectors, occupations, and insecure forms of jobs, such as informal ones. The learning objective is to identify and learn about gender inequalities in labor markets. And we will cover most of the points that I that are raised in this slide. We are going to see that the labor markets is one of the unfair structures of constraint that strongly penalize commitments of family labor and because gender roles prevail in our societies, most of this cost is burdened by women in terms of low wages, part-time jobs, and insecure forms of jobs, such as informal ones. The labor market has been shaped and constrained by gender roles, where men are seen as the primary breadwinners, while women are seen as the responsible for the bulk of unpaid caring labor. These norms and stereotypes help to consolidate perceptions of gender differences that justify women's exclusion from certain type of jobs. Women have entered the labor market massively, which resulted in a reduction in the gender gap in labor market participation in every region over the past two decades. However, the domestic burden has not been reduced in the same proportion. Neither there have been an equitable redistribution of the unpaid workload between men and women. While new opportunities for women may challenge existing roles, women continue to perform their social ascribed roles as caregivers. Also, women usually seek paid employment in sectors related to care jobs that tend to be lower paid than other types of jobs, as stated by England, Budget, and Folgren in 2002. Labor market outcomes are characterized by informalization and growing precariousness of employment, the erosion of labor rights, unemployment, persistent poverty, and increasing vulnerability of a large proportion of the working population. So the next slides are going to be based on the book chapter, Labor Market Under Glo uh, Globalization, in the book of Gender Development and Globalization Economics as of as if all people matters, written by Veneria, Gunsel, and Floro. Since the 70s, new technologies such as the electronic and digital revolution, new transportation systems, and information technologies have revolutionized production in many sectors, enabling firms to increase their productivity while saving in labor costs. In addition, these technologies have made possible the development of decentralized or modular production and distribution networks and have allowed services once produced only locally to be sourced at long list distances and traded across borders. According to Van der Hoven, 2010, since the early 90s, most economies ha also have experienced rapid growth in the service sector. Globally, the employment share of the service sector increased from 33.6% in 1991 to 43.8% in 2008. Massive increase in this share took place in East Asia and in South Asia. 
the increase of employment in the service sector reflects an increase in the share of workers engaged in informal activities, especially for the poorer regions. This relative growth of service says, has contributed enormously to the feminization of the labor force defined in terms of changing female chairs of employment. In contrast, at the global level, the chair of employment in industry hardly changed between 1991 and 2008. The industrial sector as generator of high quality employment has lost its role and this has manifested itself in the industrialization in some developed and middle income economies. Kusera and Tehani in 2014 analyzed the trend in female employment chair in manufacturing for 36 countries. They found a process of both feminization and the feminization in the labor intensive industries. The most important driver of the defeminization of manufacturer employment, meaning the declining in the female chair of employment in some uh, manufacturing sectors, such as the textile one, was associated with, with a significant technological upgrading in these industries. Several studies also emphasize that the apparent preference of employers for male workers in the context of this technological upgrading. In countries that experience a feminization of manufacture, employers perpetuate stereotypes by crowding women into jobs such as those in labor-intensive exporting manufacturing to depressing women's wages and lowering export prices. Seguino and Brownstein, Stephanie Seguino and, and Elisa Brownstein in 2018 find that labor gender segregation worsened from 1991 to 2015 with women increasingly excluded from good jobs in the industrial sectors. In many countries, labor market deregulation became the centerpiece of neoliberal reforms. Labor reforms were implemented based on the belief that labor market flexibility and competitive wages will promote economic growth and improvement in living standards. The, the reforms included the reduction of cost of firing workers, a decrease in employer contributions to social security and other non-salary benefits, facilitations of hiring temporary or contingent workers, dismantling or weakening of labor law enforcement institutions, which relieve the pressure on firm compliance. This modern process of structural change and the policies associated with globalization have failed to produce significant and sufficient high quality jobs, with the result that women, more than men, are crowded into low qual qual quality employment, as stated by Seguino and Brownstein in 2018. So the consequence of this labor market restructuring was, for instance, the decline of unions. Numerous studies have concluded that the decline in unions within a specific countries has contributed to the growing inequality. Of the 58 countries for which the ILO published data, union density fell in 42 countries from the mid 80s to the mid 90s. In numerous cases, the, the decline exceeds 20% as registered by Floro and Mayors in 2009. Historically, union jobs in some countries such as the US and Canada were held largely on skilled and semi-skilled men working in private sector industries, such as manufacturing, transportation, construction, forestry, and mining. Nancy Fulray in her book, Who Pays for the Kids in 1994, for, stated that, male trade unionists also exploited the concept of a productive housewife when they demanded a male family wage sufficient to support their wives as well as their children. Women, they argue, had no need to earn higher wages. The concept of family continues to exercise a covert influence. Employers often provide more generous benefits packages to, to men than women. Also a consistent finding in Canada, the US and in UK is that unions tend to reduce wage inequality among men but not among women. Women, sorry. The male breadwinner worker notion of the post-war 
uh, war second period based on a predominantly male labor force with a stable employment and attachment to a specific firm has been replaced by a less stable labor contract still in the process of transformation. The decline in union membership has been accompanied, accompanied night by a drop in average wages and a reduction in the coverage of pension benefits among workers. And very important, a lower bargaining power of workers to resist poor working conditions. Of particular concern are the trends toward decline in employment security and other types of workers' protections. The increasing risk that labor in general must bear in the context of declines in workers' voice and collective bargaining. The enormous shift in the organization of production and the association associated labor market restructuring have resulted in rising labor market insecurity. At the same time, individuals workers face more unstable working conditions with fixed term contracts that force them to search for work frequently to adapt to highly flexible labor market conditions. The new labor contract means that workers are the ones who bear most of the risk of this flexibility, mainly for fluctuations in their income, given the low, weak, or even non-existent safety nets. Jobs that used to pay family wages to workers with low levels of education gave way to jobs with individual wages, putting pressure on the other family members to enter the workforce. Increasing job and income insecurity has contributed to the increase in the proportion of women in the workforce. So now I'm going to read a quote by Seguino and Brownstein. Sorry, it's not, but, um, the, it's, it's, it's wrong, the, the last name of Brownstein in the, in the slide, sorry. Women may also be pushed into employment as a result of the impact of global stagnation and unemployment on men's earnings. Economic crisis, cuts in public provisioning, or simply the increasing commodification of daily life that accompanies globalization, regardless of level of de development. In these cases, women are said to engage in these trade cells of labor to buttress family income as male earnings decline and or financial pressures increase. The adoption of neoliberal policies and intense competition in export markets, especially after the 80s, has led to the low informants of work, workers' rights and easing of labor laws, undermining democratic institutions and weaken the voice of vulnerable segments of the population. Labor markets in many developing countries are also facing high levels of informality. Like the harris todaro model, the economy of some countries was conceptualized in dualistic terms, whereby the informal sector was characterized as backward and of low productivity, in contrast with the formal or modern high productivity sector. The two were also considered to be operating separately and independently of each other. It was assumed that with modernization and industrialization, the formal sector will expand and absorb most informal activities and the associated working population. This prediction did not materialize. By the mid 90s, it had become clear that the informal sector had not gone away with economic growth, nor had it been absorbed by the modern sector. In these photos that I'm showing you, you can see the informal settlements that have been generating in various cities in developing countries. Just as these informal dwellings arise in the cities, they also generate informal jobs. These informal settlements are hardly absorbed by formal constructions and represent a risk in the urban expansion since they are related to low coverage of public services, violence, and poverty. Likewise, informal workers are excluded from the old forms of employment protection and employer-based benefits. They are not involved in the typical type of social contract that, regul that regularize so salaried and wage workers. The service sector, which employs more than half of all workers in developing countries, is characterized by low productivity and low pay, often informal workers linked with traditional modes of production. Firm reorganization and decentralization of production and supply chain, chains have extended these linkages 
links to the distinction between two economies, the formal and informal, and has become really unclear the frontiers between the formal and informal sectors. Market deregulation has also made it challenging to identify where formal sectors ends and where informal sectors begin. I will take some minutes to talk about domestic service, which is a occupation very important in the context of developing countries. Domestic service remains an essential source of informal employment for women in many countries, particularly those with high levels of income informality and income inequality. However, they are subject to high levels of job insecurity and do not have access to safety nets when they are unemployed or unable to work, as we saw with the COVID-19 crisis, making their working lives high sensitive to economic fluctuations and the cycle. It is important to highlight some of the factors that have played a determining role in the persistence of high level of informality in domestic service work. In the first place, cultural prejudice dies rooted in this role of women in caring for the home have contributed to the fact that domestic work is perceived as an occupation that does not deserve to have the same labor guarantees enjoyed by other types of jobs. Second, the existing imbalances of power in the labor relationship causes domestic workers to be subject to the worker conditions imposed by the employers and exposes domestic workers to a situation of subordination. Finally, some of the characteristics of the occupation, such as that the workplace is at the private sphere at households, where contact with other domestic workers is almost null, make it difficult for authorities to monitor compliance with labor standards and limit communication between domestic workers, thus hampering the voice to voice dissemination of labor rights. So let's now have a closer look at the gender gaps in the labor market. What I will present to you has been taken mostly from the ILO report in 2017. Women's global labor force participation rate is lower than men, reaching at 38.5%, which is 26.5 five percentage points below that of men. The rate of improvement has been low since 1990 and has been slowing since 2009. Gender gaps in labor market participation are especially wide in Arab states, Northern Africa and Southern Asia. In contrast, women's participation rates are gradually approaching those of men in developed countries. Much of the progress achieved over the past couple of decades in these countries can be attributed to the fact that women and men in these countries have nearly equal educational achievement. However, more importantly, women in this context face less restricted social norms regarding paid work. Developing countries also show the smallest gender gap in participation rates, However, low gap in participation rates might be related to more needs to seek paid employment in these economies with, so, with low social protection, coverage, and benefits. The 2016 Gallup World Poll covering 142 countries illustrates that constraints women face are a function of a range of factors that extend beyond economic development. The survey results demonstrate that globally, most women, around 79%, prefer to work at paid jobs despite their employment status. At the global level, the most important constraint reported by women in the struggle to balance work and family and is followed by abuse, harassment, or discrimination. The labor market outcomes themselves can influence the, dec the decision to participate in the labor market in the first instance. However, unequal labor market outcomes, for instance, women are paid less or have limited occupational opportunities can shape the decision to participate. 
So while women are less likely to participate in the labor force, they are more likely than their male counterparts to be unemployed when they do participate. And this is really worrying. A higher unemployment rate can also affect the decision to participate. Probably the women who decide to do so, to participate, are more likely to find a job, which means there might be a positive selection bias, meaning we are observing in the labor market those women with better characteristics. Even, however, even when women have jobs, it is evident that there are clear differences or gaps by sector and occupation. Gender segregation in these dimensions remain persistent and it is a symptom of important underlying differences in opportunities for women and men, particularly in terms of access to different types of jobs. In this slide, you can see a measure of gender segregation in employment distribution. Women are relatively more concentrated in sectors or occupation when the female share out of the uh, total female employment in the sector occupation is higher than the male chair. Sorry, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm messing around with this. So how we're going to measure the gender segregation in employment distribution? We're going to measure it like this. We're going to take out how many women are in each sector uh, with respect to the total female occupation. And we're going to compare that chair with the male one. If the female chair is higher than the male one, then we're going to say that there's a segregation in that occupation for female. In this figure, we chose the global average segregation across all sectors, and it shows that it has increased between 1997 and 2017, from 15 percentage point to 20.5 percentage point. So this would mean that to achieve match allocation of men and women in every sector will require a shift of one in every five men or women to different sectors. At the global level, education, health, and social work are the sectors with the highest relative concentration of women, followed by wholesales and retail trade. In all regions, construction, transportation, storages, and communication, and public administration have a relative high concentration concentrations of men. So in addition to gender segregation by sector, there's also gender segregation by, by occupational group. Men are more highly concentrated in the following occupational groups, craft and related trades workers, plant and machine operators and assemblers and managers. In contrast, women are more highly concentrated in the service and sales workers and profession, professionals group in, in professionals groups. If women are segregated into certain occupations and those occupations are not growing, this phenomenon can have a severe impact on labor market output. Part-time employment also is, we can see huge gaps in terms of gender. Part-time employment can offer work flexibility and act as a potential entry point to full employment for both men and women, but may also reflect constraints on entering full-time employment. Particularly for women, the traditional role as caregivers is found to increase the gender gap in part-time employment. In 2015, 42.4% of female part-time workers cited family or personal responsibilities or looking after children or incapacitated adults as the reason for their part-time employment, compared with only 11.8% of male part-time workers. This underscores how women's greater care responsibilities disproportionately impact the time intensity of their employment. In some OECD countries, for example, in Netherlands, 58% of employed women work part-time, far higher than the share of employed men, which is only 19%. With respect to informality employment, as a share of total employment, the direction of the gap depends very much on the income group considered, but also on the definition used 
for measuring informality. For instance, among 107 countries with available information, women are underrepresented in informal employment in emerging countries. In contrast, among developing countries, women are overrepresented by 4.9 percentage point and uh, 4.9 percentage points. Sorry. Women in informal employment face significantly higher economic vulnerability with adverse consequence for their welfare and that of their households. In this table, I'm showing Barrientos 2004 uh, study for Latin America between 1990 and 1998. I'm not going to take too much time into these numbers, but as you can see, women in Latin American context are overrepresented into the informal jobs. In the case of Latin America, Barrientos 2004 argues that for some women workers, informal employment is triggered by the following factors. The need to avoid social insecure payroll taxes in order to generate enough net income to satisfy basic household needs. Earnings in formal employment are in specific sectors or specific skill levels too low relative to informal employment earnings. Earnings in the formal sector fail to reward individual worker productivity. This may be a consequence of discrimination against women in employment and pay. Receipt of social insecurity benefits is unlikely or, or uncertain in certain in some contexts. Hyperbole taxes combined with unlikely or uncertain benefits as well. And workers are covered through family members. This is especially important in the case of women who can be covered in held by their spouses. spouses. Globally, 14.9% of employed women are contributing family workers compared with 5.5% of employed men. The gender gap for contributing family workers is widest in developing countries where 36.6% of women and 70.2% of men are engaged as contributing family workers. So let's now turn into a, the unequal remuneration between women and men and how it has been persistent over time. Femaly, female hourly earnings are lower than male in most parts of the world. Part of this is explained by occupational and segregational, sectoral segregation between men and women. Look at, at all different estimates on average, women are paid approximately 20% less than men. However, there are wide variation among countries with the mean hourly gender pay gap ranging from 34% in Pakistan to minus 10.3% in the Philippines. Another observation which is important is that the gender pay gap is higher when the estimate is based on monthly wages rather than hourly wages, reflecting the fact that in most countries, women and men differ significantly in respect of working time. Specifically, as I have already mentioned, the part-time work is more prevalent among women than among men. So what can explain the difference in remuneration between men and, and women? Difference in the remuneration of men and women can be partially explained by individual characteristics, such as education, skill, and exper experience. However, after, after controlling for these observed characteristics, some of the gender pay gap remains unexplained. Blau and Kahn in 2016 study used microdata for 2010 for the United States. The study shows that after controlling for observable factors, such as education, job experience, and occupation, 38% of the gender gap remain unexplained. Budik and England, 2001, is one of the first studies to highlight that women earn less than men because there is a penalty associated with motherhood. This penalty may be explained because women acquire less experience in the labor market, are less productive at work, women are willing to exchange high wages for more mother-friendly jobs, and lastly, they may be discriminated against by employers. This study does not find that 
mother-friendly characteristics of the jobs explain a great bulk of their gender wage gap. However, the tendency of mother looking for part-time job is more frequent than for non-mothers. England et al. provide empirical evidence that supports the hypothesis that those who work in occupations involving care giving face a, a relative wage penalty. Women represent a very high proportion of care jobs. They find that those workers who are employed in caregiving occupation earn, on average, a lower hourly wage than those workers that are employed in jobs with the same characteristics, skill demands, and qualifications required to perform the job. The following different mechanisms explain these results, and I'm not going to take too much of my time in this because I know you will get uh, to know more in depth about this, these results. But the economic dependence of those who need cares, the association of care with women and motherhood, the difficulty of achieving productivity gains per worker in the care sector, the trend of caregivers, and market wages to be, to be lower in jobs that involve intrinsic motivation. Lastly, in 2014, Claudia Golding argues that the that the, the gap is a result of non-linearity of annual earnings with respect to, our, to hours worked. Annual earnings for some occupation, like legal and financial, are convex with respect to hours, meaning shorter hours work yield a disproportionate reduction in earnings. Golding advocates a less restrictive labor market in terms of working hours, that is, to stimulate greater flexibility, which gave more greater independence and autonomy to workers, and ask that companies do not disproportionately incentivize individuals who work longer hours. We have to talk as well about intersectionality regarding gender gaps in the labor market. Intersectionality analysis investigate whether women with different combinations of identities have different degrees of penalties in the labor market outcomes. For instance, the, in addition to the gaps between men and women, some gaps increase one it, once it is considered race, for instance, black versus white, age, young versus adult, or urban versus rural, immigrants versus native, or even among se different sexual orientations. Workers with multiple social silent identities, such as race and gender, are affected in different ways. Labor market outcomes are qualitatively different from the mere sum of the effects of each identity taken separately. We can find triple penalties, which are not additive, but multiplicative. And last, to end my talk, the literature has shown that the economic cycle affects men and women differently in labor market indicators. For instance, men's jobs growth appear to be more sensitive to the economic cycle than it is for women. And the economic cycle can affect gender gaps condition on the context and existing gender occupation segregations. The COVID-19 pandemic effects has brought to light how recessions can hit women harder, triggering gender inequalities issues in the short and in the long term. The main channels whereby this pandemic has affected women's employment are those associated with the lockdown measures adopted to contain the health crisis. COVID-19 recession has sharply affected the contact intensive sectors such as personal care services, restaurants, hospitality, among others, due to the social distance measures. These high contact sectors have large shares of female workers, hence affecting more women than men. Since lockdown started, there has been a dramatic increase in childcare provided at home due to the closures of schools and daycare centers. During pre-COVID-19, women spent considerably more time on childcare and household chores than their male counterparts. Time surveys suggest that both men and women spend more time on child care, child care during the lockdown, especially among parents with young children. However, the increase in men's child care time was small compared to women's during the lockdown. Globally, evidence indicates that the rise in care work during the pandemic has fallen disproportionately on the shoulders of women. However, the effect of the pandemic recession in employment contrasts sharply with the typical characteristics 
of early economic downturns. Women's jobs have been more strongly affected than men's employment, consistent with a prominent role of childcare and sector occupation channels. Women were more likely to experience loss in working hours relative to men, and with a few exceptions, more likely to report job losses than men. Job losses are exceptionally high in the informal economy where working women are prim primarily concentrated, but information concentrated, sorry. The impact of COVID-19 on women's labor market experience and intersection by rest race, ethnicity, class, disability status, and other identities have been an active area of research, especially in the US, where job losses were often worse for women of color. Thomas Masterson, 2021, documents how in the US, not only did unemployment rates for women exceed, exceed those of men during the early months of the pandemic, but they were even higher for Hispanic women and black women. Some of the most considerable losses for Black women in the US came from low wage occupations such as cashiers and childcare workers. So, some conclusions about these sessions. We have learned that gender gaps in the labor market, in some aspects such as participation and wages, have been reduced considerably. However, other gaps persist, such as difference in occupation and industry gender composition. One of the reasons of this persistence in the gap is the presence of children as one of the key drivers of remaining gender inequalities. Most women are forced to value jobs attributes that make careers better comp comp compatible with domestic chores, usually resulting in poor labor market results, such as low wages, part-time jobs, low coverage of social security, among others. And last, which I find really interesting, is the concentration of women in care-related occupation sectors that can explain low wages in those uh, sectors related to care, the so-called care pay penalty. Thank you very much. So here you can find again the main reference and all the supplementary reference that I used for this uh, presentation. So now we're going for our group exercise. And as yesterday, I will ask you to select one of your members as a presenter to prepare one slide on, on the following uh, questions. And just to present this slide in not more than two minutes. So the discussion, and I'm really excited about this and what you have to say. Imagine that you, have the power to close one, just one of the labor market gender gaps. I'm sorry, it's just one, not, not more than that. What gender gap would you close and why? And again, would your answer change with the context and why? Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. I'm Nancy Fulbright. I've taught economics at UMass Amherst for many years. I am now mostly retired from teaching, but um, doing a lot of research uh, as part of the Political Economy Research Institute and also affiliated with the Levy Institute. And I'm um, super glad to be here. I think this is a really extraordinary opportunity a really amazing collection of participants and staff and faculty, and hopefully the beginning of a more longstanding international collaboration around feminist economics, gender care, uh, macro issues. So um, I think it's it's a, a really historic and important event. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, talk today about demographic change and the demand for care. And then we'll follow that up in um, the next uh, day's uh, lectures with a discussion of what care means or how we think about it and then how we measure it or try to measure it using uh, time use surveys. And um, the overview I'm gonna give today uh, I've got a lot of slides to cover, and I think rather than using breakout rooms, I'm going to instead try to leave room 
for a general discussion and see how that goes and whether um, decide then whether we want to use the breakout rooms tomorrow. I was kind of impressed with the way they worked in this last session. Um, so I think they should remain a part of our, our kind of repertoire. But um, I also want to try having just a general discussion. And um, I haven't set up official office hours. Uh, I'd, I'd kind of rather uh, be in dialogue with you via email. Uh, it's kind of an old fashioned, maybe it's a generational thing, but uh, sometimes I like to have a written record of what people have said and what responses have been. But I'm flexible there too. If it seems like it would be helpful to have um, a, uh, a, a kind of a Zoom office hour session, uh, you'll just have to, we'll, we'll just have to play it by ear and, and see how that goes. So I'm hoping that you will give me some feedback along the way. It won't be just a, a one-way street. But I am going to start with the PowerPoint. So let me just share my screen. So what you're seeing here is a, a kind of a stylized picture of an age uh, pyramid. Uh, and I'm going to show you some empirical examples of that. Uh, in a few minutes, uh, but it's kind of a good metaphor for the way we think about uh, the connections between demographic and economic change, the, the changing relative size of different age groups. So each bar here represents the size of, of, of the youngest population. Usually the male population is on the left and the female population on the right, fairly symmetrical in terms of sex ratios. You see the different sizes of these different age cohorts, and it's the shift in the relative size of these cohorts that's driving a lot of the concerns about demographic change. So here's my outline. First, I want to talk a little bit about the importance of integrating demography and economics. Then just to outline the most important contours of demographic change. Uh, I think this is kind of mostly by way of kind of review and getting ourselves in sync. Then talk more specifically about dividends, uh, quote unquote, um, of different population structures and also possible disadvantages. And these kind of relate to dependency ratios and, and social policy, which is where we'll end. So the project of integrating demography and economics in a way is, is pretty much the same thing as, I mean, not exactly the same thing, but sort of the same thing, right? is related to efforts to integrate care or reproduction or social reproduction. Maybe I feel this way because I started out as a demographer. I, I just happened to get a research assistantship at a population center at the University of Texas many years ago. And uh, it really influenced the way that I thought about economics. Um, and today I tend to talk about, uh, I tend to use a phrase that to me kind of represents this effort to integrate demography and economics, to think about care work as the creation, the development and the maintenance of human capabilities. So it's a process that has um, a lot of different dimensions, but um, it's, it's unique and it's kind of output or, or its motivation or its goal, which is to um, relates to human capabilities. So the title for this lecture, which was kind of set in advance was about the demand for care. But it's really important to notice that there's a big difference between demand and need. Um, and economic theory, even textbook neoclassical theory acknowledges that these are not the same because demand is usually taken to mean effective demand or, or purchasing power. You know, something, it's a relationship between quantity and price that you could draw um, as a downward sloping line in a graph. And care is not just about demand, it's about need. Um, dependence, and by dependence, I mean literally people who depend on others for assistance whether they're young children, whether they're adults suffering illness or disability, or whether they're the frail elderly, they don't necessarily have income 
and they don't necessarily exercise choice or think about their relationship between quantity and price. Um, not certainly not in the market, not always in the family, and not always in the polity. So when we think about um, demographic change and projections, I think it it reminds us that it, that need is distinct from quote unquote demand. Uh, some of you who have studied some Marxian economics may have um, heard of a famous tract by Piero Sraffa called The Production of Commodities by Means of Commodities. Um, it's kind of a mathematical treatment of the uh, uh, something very close to the labor theory of value, and not, although not exactly the same. I like a different phrase. I like to think about the production of people by means of people, um, seeing commodities as an input into that rather than the other way around. And the intellectual history of classical political economy is very telling because for the most part, even within Marxian theory, labor is not considered something that is produced. Uh, it's, it's given, uh, it's, it's exogenously determined. It's just somehow outside the, the economy. And this is really apparent in macro models. Uh, and I think it'll come through in the later discussions in the, in the lectures that um, population growth and by inference, long run labor supply are usually taken as exogenously given. Um, they're not that are not really integrated into the uh, mechanics of most models. Now, there's some exceptions and some of the human capital literature uh, uses the word investments in human capital uh, to describe spending on education and health and so forth and so on, but it's a very half-hearted use of the term. Um, and public uh, spending on health and education is not treated as an investment anywhere that really matters and in national income accounts or you know, thinking about GDP growth or so forth and so on. It's, it's really pretty, pretty much been sidelined. So all of the categories, our whole accounting system, uh, not just accounting for gross domestic product, but you know, accounting for uh, its subsidiary parts, including you know, family income are, are, are really omitting um, the production of human capabilities. So family spending is not really counted as anything but consumption. The value of family time is occasionally imputed, but it's not really uh, considered investment. Although I think it should be. Often in fact, go just the opposite, spending on health and education is treated as an unproductive burden or a constraint on economic growth. and. Uh, I think we should instead consider improvements in health and education as among the most important outputs of economic development. And, and, and this is gonna be important in thinking about dependency burdens because they are often described just that way as burdens, something that's uh, slowing us down rather than something that's intrinsically important um, to provide. Uh, so my starting point as a kind of criticism of the way that demography and dependency are not integrated. Um, and I think the way they're integrated is really important and they, they do really matter. And a lot of the literature on quote unquote burdens of dependency is still important, even if you don't agree that it should be always designated a burden, okay? There, I think there clearly are trade-offs between the quantity of global population and the quality of life of the global population. I think environmental and ecological constraints are binding, even with rapid technological change. I think um, climate change um, in particular poses an immediate as well as a long-term threat. So uh, we really need to take these trade-offs uh, seriously. So let's think a little bit about the contours of demographic change. I'm just gonna give a very stylized summary here. Uh, global fertility rates, have fallen on average since the 1960s. Have, they've fallen to, to half of what they were in the 1960s. So right now, the global average is about 2.5 children per woman um, today. And uh, in some countries, including the US now, also China, uh, uh, 
also Italy, Japan, Korea, many, a growing list of, of, of countries, uh, fertility rate is below replacement. That is uh, uh, about 2.1 uh, children per woman is needed to, to actually replace the existing population. So we can look ahead and uh, to a period of time when actually, uh, if trends continue, global, the size of global population will eventually begin to decline. The other really big change uh, on a global level is a big increase in life expectancy. And of course, it's uneven. Of course, in many countries, life expect expectancy has lagged behind. Inequality has a tremendous uh, effect even within individual countries. But it's still a hugely important fact that uh, the li average life expectancy was 48 years in 1950. And uh, now it's over 72 years. It was 72 years in 2016. And what this, uh, what these demographic trends are doing is changing the age structure of the population. So just to illustrate this, there's a very beautiful graph. Uh, it almost looks like a flower or something opening up. It's kind of showing the uh, early population pyramid is in dark blue. And you see it's it's very much a pyramid. That is, the, the uh, size of cohorts at the bottom is much greater than the size of cohorts at the top. And uh, in each successive year, we've seen, of course, this generation is growing up over time. And so uh, every decade, there's more representation at the old, older groups. And you can see this um, prediction by 2100. Uh, it's really no longer a pyramid. It's kind of looking more like a turnip or an onion or something uh, like that. And uh, this obviously has pretty important implications for the, the needs of the global population. Oh, here's an animation I liked, I wanted to share with you. It's, it's for the US, but the animation really shows you how the, on, in one specific country, the age structure is really changing. Let's see if I can. I guess in my version, I could, I could stop it, but it won't, animation won't let me do it. But I'll talk really quickly. So 19, <laughs> okay, this is the future, very rectangular. This is in the 50s, very much a pyramid. So you can see it's actually becoming a rectangle. And if you think about it, what it's gonna become is an inverted pyramid if trends continue. Uh, that is with actually really small, you know, teeny tiny cohorts at the bottom and big co cohorts at the at the upper age distribution. Okay, so that's really relevant to thinking about the demand for care. Um, but we also want to think about care supply. Who who are the caregivers and what's happening with uh, the supply side? So we know that female paid labor force participation rates have increased from a worldwide average of about thirty percent in 1960 to above 50% in 2017. They've kind of leveled off. So, and we don't really know what the future holds, but um, it uh, clearly implies a reduction in the supply of unpaid care as women have moved into paid employment. It's also true that mobility has increased, not just internationally um, with big, uh, big uh, uh, migration flows across countries, but also within countries, uh, especially big countries, it matters. Mobility rates uh, have really disrupted a, a lot of uh, mutual aid, uh, you know, care for the elderly and the young, et cetera, in, within families because they're not living, families are, are less likely to live in the same place. Uh, in, in affluent countries, we've seen a big increase in single member households and families uh, maintained by women are on the rise. In many countries, there's uh, tilted sex ratios. Um, and polygamy is another uh, kind of phenomenon that reduces the likelihood that young men will marry. So um, uh, family structure and, and physical location are gonna have some significant implications for care provisions. And that's what brings us to thinking about dividends and, and disadvantages. So uh, probably most of you are familiar with the concept of a demographic dividend. If the initially, the first stage of fertility decline 
reduces the demands for private and public expenditures on children, and it also reduces demands on maternal time. So what you see is a significant increase in the ratio of the working age population to the dependent child population, while the size of the dependent elderly population remains largely unchanged. And that should, in principle, be a big boost to economic growth. It's freeing up resources for investment in capital goods that will increase per capita living standards and facilitate movement of women into wage employment. So the, the first stage uh, of fertility decline is a dividend. Uh, but the second stage is maybe a penalty because of this possibility of the pyramid inverting. So fertility decline drops below replacement. The size of the elderly population becomes very large relative to the working age population. Um, uh, even if you're counting on the 65-year-olds to take care of the 85-year-olds, that becomes problematic because of changes in the rec relative size of the cohorts. And if fertility remains below replacement forever, uh, basically the population goes to zero. So <laughs> pretty not good for the future of the human species. So does that mean that below replacement fertility is like really bad, bad, bad? No, I don't. I don't. I think the answer is more nuanced. Um, there are big advantages to fertility decline and increased investment in the capabilities of the smaller cohort. There are big ecological benefits. There could be some political benefits. This is very speculative and maybe too optimistic, but it could encourage more international migration on much better terms. That is where countries are really, affluent countries are really needing migrants to help enhance their labor supply and willing to provide uh, better legal and social rights, certainly something we should fight for whether or not the demographic pressure is there. It could possibly improve the bargaining power of care workers if there's a shortage of care workers. Um, and it, it could in encourage, I think more broadly efforts to reorganize and reward care work. And I, I think we're already seeing a few indicators of that with the, the uh, response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, but uh, it's really hard to say how this is all gonna shake out. I think there's some kind of big things, big theoretical issues to think about and uh, worth considering. Uh, Paul Samuelson observed decades ago that the market, the market is just not capable of optimizing intergenerational transfers or relations. Yeah, I mean, people can save money for their old age and, but they're gonna use that money presumably to hire people to take care of them. Well, <laughs> what if there are no young people to hire? That could be a problem. So savings, individual savings and social savings is not a solution to the problem. Um, you know, patriarchal institutions, if we look back um, at their history and their evolution over time, uh, yes, patriarchal institutions have uh, created this terrible legacy of gender inequality and also age inequality that we're still dealing with today. But one thing that patriarchal institutions did is they really enforced intrafamily transfers. And, and now they're weakened and nothing really has come around to take their place. And I think that that's the problem that we, we need to think, rethink our intergenerational and intergender kind of contract. We need to redefine our rights and responsibilities. And to remember that intergenerational transfers are kind of a site of collective conflict. And by the way, not just collective conflict based on gender, but collective conflict based on race, ethnicity, class, citizenship, and a lot of other uh, group, group identities that, that really our future is at stake here. And uh, it, it's, it's not just individual competition, it's also group competition that's kind of threatening to undermine the kind of cooperative, collaborative social institutions that we need to put into place. So uh, let me just uh, briefly go over some of the um, material in the readings and, and uh, this PowerPoint is gonna be posted so you're not gonna have to worry about uh, taking notes on it. We, you can go back over it and email me if you have any questions. But um, the first thing I wanna say is there, uh, there is a huge literature that looks at the standard dependency ratio, the sum of children and elderly divided by the working age population. And that's referred to in both of the readings. I think it's time to say that this ratio is just 
not very useful. It's very crude. Uh, the population of working age is ambiguous, especially considering unpaid work. A lot of elderly continue to do a lot of unpaid work, uh, even if they've retired from employment. Children and the elderly do not have identical needs, and they should be weighted very differently. Uh, even the definition of children, the definition of the elderly varies across countries and contexts. And the working age population includes a lot of people with disabilities and health problems. And so it's not as though they're the ones who, you know, they, they lack any dependency of their own. It's really important to disaggregate dependency. Financial support is um, very distinct from personal supervision and assistance. Paid assistance is very different from unpaid assistance. Where, who is going to meet the needs? Is it going to be the state, the market, the families, women, family members? How are the costs of caring for dependents going to be distributed? Who's going to pay for them? Sometimes you see um, a, this visual image of a care diamond. I think it's really useful um, pointing to the different sources of care provision, families, the market, the state, communities. Um, but what really matters is which is bigger than which, or which do we want to rely on? Um, you think about if you draw a little line across the axes and you look at the, I mean, connecting the vertices of the of the diamond, you can get a visual representation of kind of the length of the of the line to the to the intersectional point is an indicator of what you might rely on more. So in the first little diamond there, family care predominates, represented by F. In the second diamond, state care predominates designated by that um, the S. Community care can predominate, uh, not necessarily family-based, but kind of community-based uh, mutual aid, or you can have market care predominate. And we don't really know, I mean, clearly the care diamond varies across countries, We and clearly it's evolving, but there has not been enough attention, I think, to the different shapes um, that they can take. And that's something I'm gonna encourage you to think about. So the main points of the King et al. assignment, um, I'm just going to hit on very briefly. It focuses, I think, and this is really helpful, it focuses on unpaid family care. It says, let's look at one, one of those vertices of the care diamond. And uh, it, it kind of converts that to a market metric by asking how much those caregivers would have to be paid at a kind of replacement cost. So it's it's providing a kind of standard of comparison to think about paid and unpaid care, which I think is useful. It, it offers some calculations of what is, is gonna be needed on the extensive margin, how many caregivers, but also the intensive margin, how many hours of care. It uh, does a good job utilizing some time use survey data, data from Mongolia, Ghana, and South Korea. It makes a distinction between relational care uh, measured directly, and support care, which is kind of a public good, like housework. It, it, it's not designated, you know, that you're cooking meals for young people or the elderly, or you're cleaning house for young people or the elderly. Uh, so that support care um, is usually kind of divided up on a per capita basis to think about how it's being allocated to age groups. Um, another thing I really like about the article is it brings in years lost to disability, um, in the in the working age population, uh, but I think a limitation of of the article is it treats potential caregivers as people who are either not in the labor force or not working full time, whereas uh, we know that um, a lot of people are working full time in the market and also providing care, at least in um, many of the countries that I have have looked at. So. Uh, I've reproduced a table here that just shows you the the uh, the contrast between direct child care and direct elderly care for these three countries. Uh, but I'm, I feel like I'm running short of time, so I'm going to uh, skip over this. We can always come back to it if we want to look at it in more detail. Uh, so I already mentioned one of my concerns about the 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 treatment that. I think that the, the supply of care is also needs to include some full-time paid employees who are also providing unpaid child care and elder care on the side. 
There are also questions about economies of scale uh, in uh, indirect care, and to some extent in childcare, uh, economies of scale are relevant. Uh, that, and that needs to be brought in when looking at time use uh, data. Um, something I'll go into in more detail in the lecture on time use is that supervisory care is really key for young children. You just can't leave them alone. Um, and uh, in most countries, it's against the law or certainly against cultural norms to leave them alone. The elderly often need some direct care or direct assistance, but a lot of elderly people are somewhat, or at least partially self-sufficient. And also the elderly population is way more heterogeneous than children. And some people in their 80s are, are very hale and hearty and others are really, really needy. Uh, whereas most three-year-olds are, are pretty much the same in terms of what, what they need. So that's sort of a challenge for families and for societies to, pl to plan ahead. Okay, so the Mason and Lee reading, um, I really like because it's indicative of this project, the National Transfers Account uh, project that is calling on countries uh, to provide more data on intergenerational transfers and then more recently on intergender transfers and really emphasizing greater investments in education, health, and family building can partially countervail the cost of aging, um, changing age structure. And um, there, there are a lot of details about it that I, I won't go in, into detail here. Maybe that's something that could come up in the discussion. I don't know if any of you have been involved with any of the national accounts, transfer accounts projects or interested in it. Um, I think they're very well intended uh, reaching for kind of generational and gender equity, maybe not as clear as I think they should be on how these things should be defined. Um, and I have a lot of unanswered questions about them. Um, I think it's a really great research agenda. I think maybe one of the reasons I wanted to uh, bring this in was that uh, you know, both the, uh, you know, it's just better, better projections of the demand for care, better projections of the supply of care, better uh, empirical analysis of intergenerational and gender transfers, um, really, really good empirical research agenda. There's some things that, that you know, that can actually be measured and, and, and can be quantified that I think economists can, can really make some, some contributions here and in, in, in trying to better understand how care needs are gonna evolve in, in the future. Okay, so um, now I think we, that we have 15 minutes left um, for a pretty general discussion. Uh, we're gonna try this out and see how it works. Um, so I'm gonna take down the PowerPoint in a minute so we can just have a conversation. I thought it'd be good to start if you have any questions about the lecture or the readings. Uh, I just wanted to, um, I don't want you to do this right now unless you want to, but if you want to, you can you can check out the population structure, the age pyramid for your own country at this, this website. Um, but I think it's also worth thinking about whether, um, you know, what the care diamond looks like for your country and also what you think it should look like. And I, I don't wanna to talk too much about time use because we're gonna do that, cover that in another lecture, but um, just as a warm up. Do, has your country implemented one? Do you have the data? Is there research on it? Uh, so you might uh, take a look at that. So with that, I'm going to stop the share.